This week on Crossfeed. Forget Easter egg hunt. Kidnap the youth group members. Forget the holidays. School's open. Forget Vanderbilt. We're Catholic. Forget Starbucks. We're Christians. And anthropologists exploring the evangelical habitat. What are these weird people up to? Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. And I'm Pastor Jim Butler out here in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts. Uh, hope you're all doing well on this Palm Sunday. It'll be our last episode before Easter and the week after Easter. And with any luck, Dale will have this up before, you know, 4th of July. <laughs> so, so my goal is to, to have these to get all caught up during the week after Easter because I'm taking a week of vacation, um, just spending time with my family and things. So, uh, so by the time you're watching this, you'll know if I made my goal or not. <laughs> That's for sure. That's for sure. But, uh, oh, <clears throat> well, if not, you could always just kidnap somebody. <sighs> this is just crazy. I've heard of doing underground services. I've heard of, you know, kind of pretending. But this was... And I've heard of kidnapping kids and bringing them to youth group. I've never heard anything this bizarre, though. Yeah, okay. So this is a a church in um, southeast Pennsylvania. Yeah. And uh, Glad Glad Tidings Assembly of God in Middletown. And uh, uh, so basically what they did is the kids from the youth group, they kidnapped them. All right, they're calling it a mock kidnapping, but since they didn't get permission from either the parents or the kids, and um, they, uh, the the idea was to prepare them for what they might encounter as missionaries. About seventeen students um, at the meeting, the mock kidnappers. Mock kidnappers uh, covered the students' heads, put them in a van, and interrogated them. Neither the students nor the parents were told about the raid beforehand. He said, though it was discussed with the parents of one youth who might uh, who might have health issues. Yeah, and this uh, <laughs> the mom of one fourteen-year-old girl filed a complaint with the police. She said they pulled the chair out from underneath me, told me to get on the ground. I had my hand behind my back. They said, "Just do as I say. You won't be hurt." The girl said the teens were taken to the pastor's house where it appeared he was being assaulted. Yeah. Eventually, the adults in charge revealed it was a staged event. Okay, so here's the deal. If you don't get permission, it's not a mock kidnapping. <laughs> it's a real kidnapping. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if, you don't even, if you don't tell them it's going to happen. Right. Yeah. Now, it would be one thing if they sort of talked to the parents, didn't tell the kids because they wanted it. And I'm not even, I'm, I'm not convinced that that would be even be a good idea because it could really traumatize these kids. I mean, they're kids. Right. And, um, but they didn't even check with the parents. Nope. Just often did it. So that's kidnapping. <laughs> Yeah, I it think is. I would have had a little bit more sense. I think I would have at least uh, checked with, oh, my liability insurance. <laughs> yeah. So, um, wow. Well, that, that, that might have been a good part if somebody gets a check with. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, much thought was given to the safety aspect, except maybe the um, sort of mental, emotional safety of the children. Um, I don't know. This, this whole thing is just ridiculous. All right, it, um, if you're a youth group leader or uh, anybody at all, don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> As they used to say on all the things that, on television and stuff, don't do this at home. <laughs> yeah, don't do this at home or anywhere else. <laughs> That's right. This is not a safe idea. This can get you all kinds of trouble, and you know, you upset the kid too much, get you into all kinds of. Uh, Nastiness with uh, with with insurance and get you sued and 
Okay. Yeah, and, I mean, you know, I, I'm surprised that mom doesn't see the, you know, the pastor for malpractice or something. Can you, can you do that? I don't know. Um, I, I'm surprised that the people that are involved in this aren't in jail for kidnapping. <laughs> I mean, all right. You know, because what it comes down to is the first rule of anything that you're going to do with kids is get the parents' permission. Right. It's kind of a no-brainer. No. Okay. So, for instance, you talk about about kidnapping. Okay. Um, when I was in high school, the um, our youth group was had talked about going uh, Christmas caroling, and um, and I kind of forgotten about it or whatever. And, uh, and so they just like a bunch of the kids from the youth group just showed up at the house and said, all right, come on, let's go. We're going Christmas caroling. And and I was like, huh, what? And you know, and, and it was like, come on, we're going, let's go grab your coat. And, and it was like, oh, uh, okay. Well, <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, and, and so, you know, whereas that it was, they just like really laid on the pressure and I went and had a great time and, you know, and stuff. And, um, okay. So that was totally different. Um, and, and that was really effective to, where we didn't have, we were having some trouble in the youth group with participation. Um, and we had a lot of, of kids that, that got involved that night because we showed up at their house and, or, you know, and, and said, come on, let's go. We're going now. Drop everything. We're going. And, um, and it actually worked, but, to just, you know, they weren't pulling chairs off from under me, <laughs> putting bags over my head or something. And this is just silliness, <sighs> just silliness. Um, you need to figure it all out. Um, oh, man. You know, this is something that you might see in some weird Assembly of God church. It is an Assembly of God church. It is, in fact, yes. Yeah, I wonder what the anthropologist would think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this one. What did you go ahead on this one? Scroll okay, this here. is from the New Yorker. Um, it's an interesting, uh, <laughs> and uh, there's an anthropologist. Her name is T. M. Lerman, and she's written in book "When God Talks Back: Understanding the American Evangelical Relationship with God." Um, no, she her dissertation was on witch and warlock cults in contemporary England. Uh, she's written a book on um, Parsis, a Zoroastrian community in India, um, and uh, <clears throat> she's written uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, now she is um, she was a spent two years uh, of as a member of a vineyard church in California, and then she spent uh, another two years as uh, another vineyard church in around Chicago. So, uh, um, so she's got a uh, some background on these four years spent in it. Now, the one thing I, uh, I and she just wrote about some of these weird stuff that these people uh, said, you know, uh, um, you know, <laughs> you know, um, you know, uh, you know, and, and and I just love some of this. If a thought pops into your hand, head, that's not normally the kind of thought you have. And above all, if it strangely matches something else your recent experience, it's probably God speaking. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, um, and then, uh, 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 just some of these other things are just kind of really weird. I like, uh, my, I, I like the bit where it says, "If you slow down a cricket song, it's playing Handel's Messiah." Yes. <laughs> They just like, okay. Anybody bother to check Snopes on that one? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, you know. Um, um, here, she uh, to a certain point she gives what may, might be called the Tolstoy formula, a description of how wrong she was to respond to things with my irrepressible scholarliness. Uh, once she says her house group was discussing uh, Jeremiah 1, 11 to 19, in which the prophet says a calamity will break forth across the land from the north. She was interested in this frightening passage, and she wanted to know who wrote it, and when, and so on. 
Uh, some scholars think it refers to the Babylonian conquest. She was gently chided by the group. The passage was not about the history of the Jews, she was told, but about God's personality. We decided that God was a planner, that he used people to fulfill his aims. We decided, she agreed. And what about her irrepressible scholarliness? Does she regret that quality of hers, or is she, on the contrary, proud of it? To achieve it, she studied for a long time at Harvard and Cambridge. To inculcate it, she's been teaching for more than 20 years. Right. So, I mean, you have to understand, first of all, that this group wasn't really sort of a typical evangelical group. Uh, not the evangelicals I've known. Um, they're pretty heavy into uh, uh, yeah, visions. Well, not, I mean, some yes, of they are. Yeah, this yeah. is this is a vineyard church. So this is they're into power evangelism, and they are into um, yeah visions. I mean, uh, one of them is talking about that she um, had this vision of boats, and then she was thinking of the pastor, and the pastor happened to call, and it's, oh, well, you're the boat, and Jesus is the captain, and Jesus has his hands on your wheel or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, it's, it's kind of weird to have an anthropologist looking at a group like this. Um. Because she clearly does not understand this group. It says that she's sort of sympathetic or whatever, but, um, of course, you also have to understand that we're reading a review right. of the book in The New Yorker. Right. So, Well, anyhow, she says, uh, you know, she said, uh, 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 yeah, and, and even the, the, the reviewer is, I'm not sure this person really understands these people. Uh, her family... She tells us in the introduction went to a Unitarian church. Her father's a psychiatrist. Out of the fact this fact she's a social scientist, professor of anthropology, and you have someone who is likely to be a secular humanist. Mm-hmm. Um, indeed, she tells us at the end of the book she cannot call herself a Christian. She doesn't believe in a God who sits out there with real the doorpost. Uh, so you kind of, I like this. Like the like the other vineyarders, she kept a prayer journal recording what I said to God and followed by what He said to me. If she didn't believe in a God who sat out there, whom did she think was saying these? She was saying these things to, and who was saying these things back to her? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, well, you know, you look at what James says about um, when you pray. If you don't believe it, don't expect an answer. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. Now the other thing is. And, and one of my concerns about this is um, that um, it's the fact that she, uh, she does say, uh, you know, this is a um, understanding the American evangelical relationship with God. This is the Pentecostal assembly of God, uh, evangelical relationship with God. I mean, this, you know, this is not going to be a conservative group of conservative Presbyterians. Or a group of uh, evangelical Lutherans, or an evangelical group of Congregationalists. Right. I mean, that's very important to keep that in mind. This is a, a different group that really does. I mean, they really do believe in vision. They really do believe God talking directly to you. Um, I mean, I was at a, a fundraiser the other night for a, a, a black pan- a black uh, Christian school, um, and um, it's run by uh, a predominantly by a, a group of um, a, Assembly of God Church and uh, called Life Church. And, you know, and this guy, you know, was joking about, you know, there some every time you turn around, some guy comes up to you and says, hey, I was praying this morning, and the Lord gave me a word for you. He goes, man, I never figured that out. Why doesn't God just talk to me and cut off the middle man? <laughs> He was, a, he was supposed to be the comedian of the night, but, you know, I mean, it was, again, I was just kind of like, yep, okay, that's, you know, that's, but that's the kind of people she's dealing with here. Yep. Um, you know, I, and I'm really kind of upset, and I think she, that this review, I don't know if it's her, this review uh, talks about Phil Yancey's book, uh, Disappointment with God, and God really wants us to like him or something like that. And I'm I Yancey's much deeper than that, so I have a, a problem. That's that. Well, you know, it's easy to um, uh, distill down a a book 
and get a right. different um, view of than what the author. You know, it's sort of like uh, uh, you look at a, at a book like um, uh, Fahrenheit 451. All right. Um, <laughs> Bradbury himself has said, um, yeah, the book was never really intended to be about censorship. <laughs> that was really sort of a peripheral bit. Um, and But that's all anybody knows about it. And then you have a bunch of literary scholars going, um, yeah, Bradbury, you don't know what you're talking about. It's all about censorship. <laughs> right. No, I, like most of his books, it's a, it's a collection of stories, and he just has kind of a framing story to tie them together. Uh, but they're all kind of short stories that are disconnected to each other. Uh, on the other hand, at the same time, uh, um, you know, <laughs> these people, different people claim to have visions of these words from the Lord, and you know. Um, but yeah, most vineyard, many vineyards, vineyarders are not fully convinced that God speaks to them, even internally. As one congregate put it, sometimes we think it's the spirit moving. It's just a burrito from lunch. <laughs> All right, so you know here's here's what it comes down to. If you have a question about you know does God um, speak in this way or not? All right, um, can he? Yes, absolutely. Has he promised to? No. All right. So where you can definitely get a word from God is in the Bible. All right, and that is the place where you can go and find absolute truth and an absolute assurance that this is actually straight from God. Okay, um, can can God speak to you during while you're praying or, or something like that? Sure. All right, and and I'm convinced that from time to time He does. All right, um, but the problem is, is any time you know something sort of enters your head that that you think might be God speaking to you, you always have to double check it against the Bible. Right. And uh, you know, and and look at and and specifically. Look at what is the message. What? Who is this pointing to? Who is this glorifying? All right. If it is pointing you to Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Redeemer, as the one who's come into the flesh to save you from your sin. All right. Then, um, then that's that's a pretty good sign. Okay. Um, often. What I see or hear from people is uh, something that basically glorifies the Holy Spirit. And one thing we see from Scripture is that the Holy Spirit never glorifies himself. He always points us to Christ. And uh, so if it's the Spirit glorifying himself, then you can be pretty sure that that's not the Holy Spirit. Maybe another spirit. Uh, but probably not one you want to listen to. So that's my take. I think you're right. Um, <clears throat> or you can just boycott Starbucks. I mean, that's what God. God is telling me we need to boycott Starbucks. This was such a good article. I love this. Now, the, the organization, by the way, this is a respect, respected pro-family organization announced this week. That is the National Organization on Marriage. That is the group that has uh, made this decision to do this. Well, it couldn't be the um, American Family Association because that's not a respected <laughs> pro-family organization. That's true, too. But go ahead and share this, this the story. I'll let you do this one. Okay. All right. So, um, so uh, Starbucks has put among its, uh, uh, well, okay, so they're launching the, this dump Starbucks campaign. Um, and uh, because Starbucks has mentioned support for same-sex marriage as a core value of the company, all right? And so they're saying, well, so we should boycott Starbucks because of that, all right? And, and the gist of, the, of this um, blog post, basically, um, is saying that, no, we should not boycott Starbucks, uh, not because they're right, but because what are you doing then? You're saying that might makes right. And you're saying that this all comes down to, um, you know, that we can get what we want by sort of forcing them economically to listen to us. But that's not the way Jesus does things. 
you know, he had the opportunity to use the, uh, the tools at his disposal, uh, to, um, to, to stand up for the truth, uh, when he was standing before Pontius Pilate. He chose not to. And it changed the world. Um, you know, what it comes down to this, and it's, it's interesting that this is about marriage. Because to me, I saw this totally as, um, as a parallel to, um, how you deal with disagreements in marriage. All right. If you're all about being right and winning the argument, you've already lost. All right. If it's all about how can I build relationships? How can I strengthen this relationship? How can I, how can I be, um, how can I show you the love of Christ? All right. Then you're on the right track. And then you have the chance of, of really having a positive impact on that relationship. All right. This is all about, I'm going to show that I'm right. All right. I'm going to force you to listen to me because look how important I am. All right. And so, you know, if, if you're going to, uh, it, it's, it's not good for, for marriage and it's not good for, um, taking a stand for marriage. You know, instead we need to talk to people, all right? Use this as an opportunity to, um, to, to be in, in conversations with people about not sort of forcing the biblical marriage model down people's throats, but, um, showing them how great it is. And, and how great it is that in marriage we have this, um, this picture of God's love for us. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave up his life for her. You know, I mean, that's a, it's, it, the God's gift of marriage is so beautiful and so wonderful when you see it for what it is. Um, that it's just everything else pales in comparison, right? When you force it on somebody, then it's not a gift anymore. Mm-hmm. And and frankly, yes, you know, you might you're not going to make that much difference. Um, um, you know, it's it's you know, in all honesty, um, it's not going to. It, I I guess if you know, it's it's like a. I remember uh, somebody up here, one of the pastors up here, wanted to have a, a boycott on Ben and Jerry's. You know, that wasn't real successful either. <laughs> mm-hmm. As far as I was concerned, you know, I mean, that was just like, you know, what, what good's it going to do? I mean, um, how, I mean, you know, okay, so, you know, okay, so this woman, so, you know, Starbucks, it, it, it's a core value and, you know, they don't even want to talk about it. Okay. I don't, I don't go to Starbucks. So it doesn't make any difference to me. Anyway, I don't like it. Uh, cause they sell coffee and I don't drink coffee. Anyway, so, um, but, you know, so, um, <clears throat> are you going to also do, you know, talk to everybody who, um, uh, uh, cleans your, does your dry cleaning? Um, you know, are you going to pull, no longer use, uh, computers by Apple or Microsoft because they have the very same position. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you uh, um, not going to watch any movie out of Hollywood because they still have they have the same position? Um, I mean, uh, are you not going to buy any uh, 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 books from Zondervan, which is or, or Thomas Nelson, which are owned now by um, the uh, uh, you know, which are owned by Harper Collins, which is owned by News Corp. You know. I mean, you know, just how how far are you going to take this? Right. That's really the question you need to ask. Well, it's like when the American Family Association tried to um, boycott Disney. Um, I know somebody that, that decided, well, okay, if, if you were going to boycott Disney and all of their holdings, um, <laughs> she started looking at whether it's even humanly possible in our society to do so. And guess what? It's not. They have their fingers in so many different things. Just about everywhere you turn, it is somehow connected with the Disney Corporation. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I mean, unless you're going to go and, you know, be a 
a hermit or something um, and live off the land and you know even though you probably end up having to buy some implements from somebody somewhere yep. <laughs> on the other hand so there's that issue but then there's another issue and that is uh, increasingly on college campuses there is um, and I'm going to I don't want to use the word war on Christianity because I don't like to use the that I don't like to use that term war again all on everything, um, but there is a real pressure on Christian groups, and um, was not helped a few years ago by a very bad decision of, by the Supreme Court, which I think uh, was completely a violation of the First Command First Amendment in terms of uh, both uh, freedom of religion and freedom of association, and that is that uh, if a uh, uh, a religious group uh, wants to have a wants to meet on the campus. They have to be uh, have a all comers policy. Now, not just to be a any just not just to come to the group, but to be a leader in the group. So, an atheist could run for leadership of a Christian group, a Jew for the leadership of a Muslim group, a pagan for the leadership of a Catholic group. So they cannot have faith or belief-based requirements for leadership, which I think is one of the stupidest things I've ever heard in my life. Um, you know, um, especially since they wouldn't do this to uh, um, the sororities and the fraternities. Right. Well, yeah, and, and, and that you, shows you, the hypocrisy you, of it. You want to talk about groups that are extremely, <laughs> you know, forget about non-discrimination. I mean, they discriminate, you know, big time, but you know they're not going to say a word to them anyhow. They so don't Vanderbilt even have an University, which policy. happens to be uh, um, Vanderbilt University, is a, is a private school, and so um, next month all the student groups must register and they have to sign a statement that they will abide by this non discrimination policy. So I mean I have no trouble seeing seriously, just to raise havoc. I have no trouble seeing a group of a group of atheists. Joining uh, the inner varsity Christian fellowship there and taking it over, right, right, because that's all no it would take. Is uh, well, let's get rid of this. We can get rid of it real fast. We'll just get a whole bunch of us to join so that we outnumber the the Christians in it, and then we'll elect one of our um, one of the atheists among us to um, to lead it. And and then that person can choose to disband it or or just you know completely destroy it. Right. Right. I mean, and it would work the, the opposite direction too. All right. What's going to stop for, for that matter? What's going to stop the, um, a, a bunch of Democrats doing the same thing to the young Republicans or vice versa uh, or vice versa. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you actually, instead of, you know, bringing corporations stuff, I think you're going to bring chaos because I think that kind of stuff will happen. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think On you college have, campuses. Uh, of course it will. Yeah. Then I think you'll have, uh, you know, uh, um, students at each other's throats for pulling stuff like that. Mm hmm. Um, and uh, so anyway, uh, the Catholic group on Vanderbilt, uh, Vandy Catholic, uh, which had about 500 members, says, nope, we don't agree to this policy. And so we're moving off campus. Um. Uh, you know, we are first and foremost a Catholic organization, says uh, P.J. Jetlovic, the president. We have qualifications, faith-based qualifications for leadership. We require that our leaders be practicing Catholics. And the university's non-discrimination policy, they have made it quite clear that there is no room for it in an organization that has these faith-based qualifications. We don't serve their kind here. Mm. Uh, it's just, I mean, like, <laughs> so, you know, we're always looking for feedback. And so here's what I want. I want feedback from anybody that thinks that this is a good thing. All right. And I'm not going to ridicule you or anything, but I really want to know. I just, I just can't see how anybody would think that this makes sense. Right, so if you if you think this makes it, please explain it to me. I mean, seriously, I don't get it. No, I you know, 
Uh, and the university is deeply disappointed by Catholic, the anti-Catholic's decision. Um, uh, we do not believe our, oh, Vanderbilt's policy does not mandate whom student organizations should elect as leaders. It simply allows any, for anyone to be eligible for membership and to seek a leadership position. Oh, you stupid idiot. Uh, Vice Chancellor of Public Affairs Beth Fortune, don't you realize that leaders are elected by a majority of the members of the group? And all you have to do then is get a majority of, the, you know, yeah, you know, okay, you, so there's 500 Catholic members in Bandy Catholic. All you have to do is go out and get 500 people that, uh, you know, you can whip up. Uh, no, 501. And so to, to, to go, join the group, and then we'll come next year, election time, vote whoever you want. Well, and, and you know, and, and seriously, right? You can get a flash mob together easier than that. I mean, right. you just post something on on Craigslist. But and since this is a a, um, a student paper or a, a, a campus thing, you could put an ad in the student paper in the classifieds, um, calling for all the you know anybody that's not a big fan of Catholics. <laughs> to, you know. Oh, are you against, you know, are, are you pro-choice? Are you uh, against the Roman Catholic position on gay marriage? You know, on and on and on. Not a big fan of the Pope, whatever. Like to pull a prank, you know, uh, whatever. I mean, right. <laughs> for Pete's sake, I'd be tempted to do it just to show how ridiculous the policy is. <laughs> I would, too. You know, um. Interestingly enough, by the way, Tennessee lawmakers are working on legislation that would prohibit the state universities from doing this kind of stuff. Um, but I mean, any faith-based group or ideological group, yeah, whether that be you know religion or political, yeah, you know, um, you know, heck, I would just you know get a whole bunch of uh, people and you know take over the Muslim group just to you know really take them off. <laughs> that would be interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, I was trying to imagine how that would go over. Not, not and and understand when I say that. Um, it's not because I believe that that any of the people in uh, the Muslim student group would be the sort of extremists that we hear about so much. Um, but the problem is, word would get back. You know, this would hit the news and. Um, you know, pretty soon you have the same thing that happened to, you know, like South Park when when they were going to show Muhammad in an episode. You know, things like that. Or I, would, or I got a better one. How about a bunch of conservative white Republicans showing up at the uh, Black Students Association meeting, taking it over? Yeah. Right. Yeah. See how well that goes. Right. Of course. Then you probably they would probably be wind up being. Uh, um. Accused of being, um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, racist. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. they're just doing what they're allowing them to do. I mean, that this is the kindest that to me it's a silly, this is a stupid and silly thing. So, anyway, um, oh, I just, uh, I, I don't like that kind of stuff at all. Um, speaking, and this is another then uh, another campus thing. Uh, this is up in my area, not too far over in uh, Stony, Univer Stony Brook University on Long Island, New York, and they. I um, guess <clears throat> again, a, a campus. They talk about being open-minded and inclusive, and then they turn around and um, exclude people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so Stony Brook University has now said that. Um, Religious holidays. Um, if, if they allow students to celebrate religious holidays, that violates the establishment clause of the First Amendment, and therefore, um, they uh, it says Stony Brook recently decided to end its long-standing practice of closing the university for major Christian and Jewish religious holidays such as Good Friday, Rosh Hashanah, 
and Yom Kippur. Um, now, I don't have a problem with that, really. Okay, it's a secular university. Uh, it is not a religious place. I Part of me has no problem with them saying this. However, the problem is that they have made it um, almost an unexcused absence for a student to miss uh, class because um, – you know they that they, they're going to celebrate Passover or Good Friday, uh, and not only that, but uh, um, they have scheduled finals on Saturdays and Sundays. Right, which they reversed that part of it, but yeah. like even the for you know, and we're talking about classes that meet on weekdays, right? Um. So, yeah, well, you got to choose. Are you going to take your final or are you going to go to church or synagogue, you know? <sighs> or if you're an Orthodox Jew, you're not supposed to take work on the Sabbath. And I don't know about you, ma'am, but when I was in college, I considered finals to be work. Mm-hmm. Right. Especially since the Sabbath begins sundown the night before. Right. Which means yeah, no you can't cramming. Even cram. But I mean, you come on. I don't. I mean, you know, I I don't know about you. You ever have one of those finals where the s the, he he could have, you know summarize the essay question basically by saying, "Tell me everything I told you in this class from the first day till now." Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's the fact that they consider this to be inclusive. You know, it's it's. You know, apparently uh, Stony Brook has made one of their core values burn the village in order to save it. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I like this this guy who wrote this. Um, who was, and he says, uh, uh, um, it's, it's not uh, Jay Suklau, it's his son. He says, it sends a message that religious observance is a meaningless waste of time that interferes with the institution's goals and cannot be tolerated. Mm-hmm. All in the name of tolerance. All in the name of tolerance. Um, now, interestingly enough, uh, this is of the four uh, universities in the State University of New York. This is the only one. Uh, Buffalo, Binghamton, Albany all continue continued to uh, honor their religious beliefs and and people, students' beliefs. I mean, I, I you know, you know, I guess I you know the way I look at it is I can say. Uh, I can see um, saying, you know, okay, we're a secular university. We take no religion, no position on religion. Uh, we understand that there are, you know, uh, other religious groups out there. We don't take their holiday off. Um, so, you know, uh, I mean, so if you happen to be Christian or Jewish or whatever, um, you are given X number of excused absences, you know, for religious reasons. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, I I think that's not a bad thing to be able to say. Or it's just, uh, just a, I mean, yeah. Yeah, and you'd have to come up with a number. Otherwise, you know, people could say, well, I'm from the church of stay in bed all day and, you know, I, I can't ever come to class. So, but, um, but yeah, having a, a certain number, you know, or, or whatever, you know, it, You know, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but when I was in, I think it was when I was in college, we had, um, you know, so many activity days you were allowed. So that if you're, you know, you were, you, you, you were in choir or drama or something and you had to go and do a production or something, you were allowed, you know, it was an excused absence. You just told the prof, you know, I've got drama clubs going to this thing. And, you know, so it's okay. It's a college approved activity. You're given, you know, you can use your, one of your activity days for that. See, I'm sure they could come up with something. When I was in college, they didn't take attendance. Ah, I went to the I University of Wisconsin. So half your classes were in giant lecture halls where there's absolutely no way they could take attendance. Um, you know, and then you have, uh, the, you know, the small group kind of stuff. They didn't take attendance at those either because, you know, what it came down to is if you come to class you'll do well in the class. And if you don't come to class, uh, good luck on the final, you know? Um, and they just, I, 
you know, said, well, students need to be responsible for themselves. Well, I mean, if they have that attitude here, I don't see it as a problem. The fact, you know, that they, you know, I really don't see where it's a problem. Right. Yeah, you just have to figure out a way to make up whatever work you miss or, you know, get the lecture notes or leave a, um, you know, do the, leave the little, rec- have one of your friends record the, um, the lecture for you so you can go back and listen to it or whatever. You know. For that matter, you could even, um, have a lot of classes nowadays. They have the lectures available online for anybody that can't make the class anyway. Right. So, you know, you could just even on, it have I, I would think it'd be simple enough for to be able to to record the lecture some way. Um and if there's a test to make it up on a different day. But still, I think it does show, you know, a a, a dis an intolerance of, of religious people. Well it's not just, I mean yeah. the fact is here is they are deliberately scheduling stuff on those days. I mean they're going out of their way. It's it's not like you know, I, I'm just waiting. the The next thing's gonna be, um, oh well, gee, we need to reschedule our winter um, break because it falls over Christmas, and we need to make sure that, you know, that we have students in class on Christmas. <laughs> yeah, nah, that, that somebody asked me about that. You know, and I, I said, yeah, but, well, they said they don't call it Christmas break; they call it winter break. So, hey, by the way, did you hear about? Hey, just to show you how silly this stuff gets, okay? Um, there's a school out in um, – well, we talked about the one school out in Wilbraham, I think, that had Green Day instead of St. Patrick's Day. Did we talk about that? I don't remember. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they had a – yeah, instead of St. Patrick's Day, it was go, go Green Day, Go Green Day or something like that. And one of my members today was telling me about Valentine's Day at his kid's middle school. It was Big Red Day. It's not like anybody knows even yeah, I mean, like the fact it's called Saint Valentine's Day, that's religious, so we have to call it Big Red Day. Yeah, but nobody calls it Saint Valentine's Day unless you're Roman Catholic. And a handful right. of Lutherans Valentine's and Anglicans. Day. You know? <laughs> it's just Valentine's Day. Right. And uh, nobody knows who he is or what a Valentine is. So <laughs> so as I said, so are the kids handing out cards saying, Please be my big red <laughs> 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 you know, it's like a football thing, you know. Go big red. Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's celebrate the University of Wisconsin. <laughs> um, but, you know, for that matter, the um, like St. Patrick's Day. Um, there was a. I remember a number of years ago there was a a bit where they was they weren't allowing the Catholic bishops to march in the St. Patrick's Day parade or something like that. And the, the whole thing was sort of ironic that um, that it's a, a parade named after a Catholic saint, and <laughs> the Catholics weren't allowed in the parade. Uh, it was in New York, of course. The reality is, I mean, you know, it's this, and, and I really don't, I don't want to sound alarmist, but I, it's almost a scrubbing of anything religious from the public square. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, um, and it, it's a, you know, a a subtle enforcement of, um, uh, in the name of tolerance, a subtle enforcement of uh, secularism and atheism. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, yeah, so it is permitting uh, or promoting a particular worldview, and that it would be secularism. Yeah. So it's just <laughs> this one guy. He says. And don't ask me about bullying. My kid hears so much about bullying. She has four classes. They talk about bullying. I'm not sure when she learns anything else she's supposed to learn. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, hey, that brings us to the end of the show tonight, folks. A little short tonight, but that's 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 not such a bad thing because sometimes these things get real long. Uh, seriously, today's Palm Sunday. I pray that you all have a very blessed Holy Week. Um, Worship Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and then just an absolute joyous Easter next Sunday as we celebrate uh, our Lord's resurrection, um, which gives us hope at the day that we too will be resurrected. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, since I know that there's absolutely no way, with this being Holy Week and a rather busy week for me, 
and I still have two more episodes in the can. Um, I, I you know, I, I, he is risen, right? <laughs> Cause it's Easter by the time you're seeing this. All right. Um, but yeah, what and a joy that those is. fireworks folks. <laughs> <laughs> be careful <laughs> but um yeah what a joy that is you know that and and here i i mentioned this this morning um in bible class that when jesus conquered death um if you you know if you go back to uh to the origin of human death um where where god said don't eat of that fruit uh because in that day you'll die all right and then they ate it and they didn't die that day all right but they did die that day because you need to understand that death is not an ending. That's a that's a secularist. That's a, a naturalist view of death. All right, death in the Bible is all about separation. All right, and on that day, the beautiful union that Adam and Eve had with God was divided. They lost that, and so they did die in their relationship with God. And um, and and when Jesus came back, he didn't just come. Uh, to, he he didn't come back to life just to restore um, physical death, or I mean, sorry, physical life, all right? Um, he came to restore our relationship with God because on the cross, he died. He was abandoned by God, all right? He was abandoned. The son was abandoned by the father so that um, so that we wouldn't have to be abandoned by him. He took our place. And so, so he died in his relationship uh, so that we wouldn't have to. And that's what he came to restore. And, and, and really just the, the living for everything that's just icing on the cake. Um, it's pretty good icing though. <laughs> we'll take it. God bless. Watch everybody. And we will talk to you on the other side of Easter. Yeah, good night, everybody. God bless. Good night.